Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. I'm going to call the meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to announce that on that. Oops, there's a little bit of an echo. Is that better? OK. That on last Friday, May 6, the board received and began its review of the proposed rates for major medical health insurance plans offered to individuals, families, and small businesses in Vermont in 2023, including plans offered on Vermont Health Connect. For uh, the individual market, Blue Cross Blue Shield requested an average 12.3% increase with plan specific increases ranging from 9.7 to 16.3%. MVP had an average 17.4% increase with plan specific increases ranging from 9.7 to 24.2%. In the small group market, Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont had an average 12.5% increase with plan specific increases ranging from 9.9 to 16.1%. And for MVP, an average of 16.6% increase with plan specific increases ranging from 8.9 to 19.8%. <clears throat> the hearings, uh, the board will conduct public hearings on the proposed rates on July 18th and July 20th, and they both start at 8 a.m. Also, the board is scheduled an evening public comment period or a public comment forum from on July 21st, starting at 4 p.m. Uh, both the hearings and the public comment, the comment form will be held, held remotely, and the board will also designate a physical location which will be available to members of the public. More information on how to attend uh, both of those, th all, all three of those sessions will be posted on our rate review website. Uh, right now, starting yes, uh, Friday, um, or actually starting Monday, May 9th, we opened a public comment period. So we'll be accepting public comment on an ongoing basis from May 9th until July 21st of 2022, this summer, at, at 11.59 p.m. Comments may be submitted electronically through our rate review website, which is on, our, on the GMCB website, by email, by US mail or by phone. And again, please visit the rate review website for more details on how to submit a public comment. All of this information will be summarized in an FYI fact sheet on our website. And if anyone has any questions, please reach out to me or uh, Kara Kreis with, with those questions. In addition, we have the ongoing public comment period regarding the next all payer model. The board encourages the general public to comment on a potential next model with CMMI on, on an all payer model and um, at any time give us that feedback. We're sharing all of that feedback with our partners at the governor's office and AHS as they are leading the negotiations on the next potential model. And then lastly, I want to announce that we have the posting for the opening on the Green Mountain Care Board on our website as uh, just as a reminder that process is uh, run by the nominating committee in the Department of Human Resources. So the link to that, those, that posting is on our website and please follow the guidance in the link if you have questions regarding the posting. And that looks like I have covered everything. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, May the 4th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 4th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Aye. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. 
With that, we'll go right into the business of this afternoon, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to Marissa Melamed. Marissa. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, and the public. My name is Marissa Melamed. I am Associate Director for Health Systems Policy for the board. I'm going to walk you through our staff uh, analysis of One Care Vermont's FY22 revised budget submission. We do have a potential vote um, notice uh, today. Um, I'm joined by um, Michelle Sawyer, who is Health Policy Project Director. She's going to walk you through uh, several of the slides and Russ McCracken, staff attorney, who is available for legal questions um, or to help with a motion. I'm gonna if they could just turn their cameras on, it would be good. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> just one minute. Thank you, Russ. All right, so let me know if that's not showing up the way it should. It, it's showing up. <laughs> Great. Um, all right, so just the agenda real quick. Um, the first several slides uh, walk you through the revised budget process, which I reviewed last week. I'm not going to review that again, um, but I left them in here just for reference, uh, references to the, to the relevant um, section of the rule. Um, what we are going to walk through today is key areas of staff review that we looked at with the revised budget. We are also going to take this opportunity to give you a sort of a status update on the budget order for 22 as a whole. Um, and then I'll turn it back to the board for discussion, public comment, and a potential vote on the uh, one area of, of adjustment. So again, these are the reference slides and I'll take you right to the areas of staff review. Um, so the first one is the condition around the ACO benchmarking solution. Um, so there was a request, an adjustment request on the language from OneCare. So we reviewed that and we have a staff recommendation. Um, and this is the uh, adjustment that you would vote on today um, if you choose. Um, other significant areas that we thought were worth discussing in this forum um, are the fixed perspective payment target and strategy reporting and what we are uh, doing there. Um, and then we're going to walk you through a variance review of the financial model and the care model. And again, this is a variance from the originally submitted budget that was approved um, in December to the revised budget, um, which is sort of part of One Care's full, full budget review process. And then at the end, we will go through the budget order status update. Um, and again, most of this is details and uh, sort of analysis that we wanted to share to make it uh, clear and, and transparent, but there's only one recommendation that we have that requires board action. So to jump into the first area around the ACO benchmarking condition. Um, so last week, One Care proposed these three changes. Um, that's the text that's uh, in black, so we have sort of our comment um, in red on on you know the staff recommendation around their proposed changes. So the first one um, says focus benchmark reporting on utilization cost cost and quality and remove patient satisfaction and engagement in evidence based clinical appropriateness due to lack of available benchmarks. So one care sent in sort of what they learned about um, collecting and reporting data in these areas. And they are requesting that we focus only on utilization cost and quality and remove those other two domains. The staff recommendation in this area is to leave the five domains in the condition, um, but we recognize that there are some um, added uh, sort of complications around um, the type of data that's collected and how it's reported in the other two domains. Um, so we wanted, so we just wanted to add some a phrase there to allow for some flexibility. Um, so our recommendation is to include the five domains, but as sort of as available and appropriate. Um, and the intent here sort of speaks to the second bullet point, which is that we, you know, we constructed this budget order condition around what we knew at the time and what we were sort of envisioning, but we've learned things since then about how this tool can be um, used and what's available. And we, our intent is to have flexibility around um, how the reporting is designed. So the second bullet point there from One Care says, uh, excuse me, 
flexibility to work with selected vendor to identify specific measures um, based on available data and have a collaborative process with the GMCB staff to determine reporting and templates. Um, this, we feel, is consistent with the intent of the condition um, and with the staff recommendation. So, um, you know, we, we accept this change. Um, and um, again, but we would like to continue to pursue the five domains as available and appropriate um, with this in mind. And then the third one says, uh, eliminate requirement for Medicaid and commercial benchmarking as vendors report lack of industry standards, low data availability and consistency, and high costs. Um, so our staff recommendation here is to not eliminate this requirement entirely. And actually, um, the One Care slide says to eliminate it, but the language that they gave us doesn't actually eliminate the requirement. Um, it's what is, well, you'll see it on the next slide. But we accept their proposal, which is basically to amend the FY22 requirement um, to be to be focused on Medicare only. Um, but OneCare will work with the GMCB to continue to pursue the feasibility of options for benchmarking Medicaid and commercial programs. We just understand that it's it's there's not an easy ready-made product like there is for for Medicare. Um, so with that, we came to this uh, proposed language, um, which is that. I'll, I'll just walk through the, the changes here. The first one is that we're going to we're making it clear in the first sentence um, that we're asking them to implement a Medicare ACO benchmarking um, system in this in this first year. So we added in Medicare. We took out build for each payer program. Um, again, around the five domains or five key areas, um, we added the phrase as available and appropriate. So that provides some flexibility for the staff to. Um, work with with one care and their vendor to to figure out what makes sense, but but not um, letting go of the fact that we are interested in information in, the, in these five domains. Um, the next change around um, the specific requirements, like or what we want the benchmarking system to do, um, we did not change. A the intent is to allow the ACO and the GMCB to assess one care's performance against peer ACOs or integrated health systems. Um, B, um, we changed the wording since it was a little bit awkward, but the idea here is that um, uh, the benchmarking system will enhance OneCare's ACO level performance management strategy, including integration of best practices and priority opportunities identified through benchmarking and peer networking into OneCare's quality evaluation and improvement program. Um, the idea here in plain language is basically that A is we want you to collect this information around benchmarking. B is we want you to do something with it. Um, show us how you are sort of bringing that into your um, quality evaluation improvement program or integrating it into your committee structure, however, however one care um, makes those decisions. And I don't think it's a little bit of a wording change, but I don't think there's an intent change here. We want them to integrate that best practices piece. Um, C is um, that um, the benchmarking system will improve ACO regulatory reporting and performance assessment by providing the benchmarking comparisons to targets um, at least semi-annually. Um, so this was also part of their request through their vendor uh, vetting process. Um, they um, uh, made a case to us that quarterly was um, not going to provide us any additional or any more meaningful information um, than semi-annually, um, and we uh, agreed with, with that. Um, and so we'll allow this change. Again, if we found that there could be some value in having them report more often, this could be changed um, in the future, but um, we agreed with that to start. So again, the final um, paragraph um, is just making it clear, this is a Medicare benchmarking system. Um, it's gonna start in FY22 as a test year. Um, they have to propose it. Um, by March 31st and present it at their uh, revised budget presentation, which they did. Um, and then we changed um, the, well, we added the final sentence, which did come from um, One Care's recommendation, which is that they will gather additional information on the feasibility of expanding benchmarking for Medicaid and commercial populations, and they will provide a written update to the GMCB um, on the um, options by October 1, 2022, which is the time of their budget submission. And this may be, um, we may learn over time um, 
about this uh, during the budget review process, but we wanted to be able to discuss it. Um, so have an initial proposal by October 1. Um, so these are the, so the proposed language change. Um, so the next steps here is that the, the GMCB uh, will vote on the amended language. Um, OneCare is in active contracting with the vendor, as they discussed last week, um, to get that finalized. They can move, move forward. Um, and OneCare is uh, working with the GMCB. Or we're, we're working together now to develop the reporting template. That, that work has already started. Um, and the first report is expected per the budget order by the end of July. Um, and I want to just state here that we do expect um, or, or we're leaving open the possibility that this will be iterative, that, it, you know, we're supposed to have an initial template by the end of June um, with a formal template by or formal report by the end of July. It's possible there could be some iterations of what this looks like before we get it right. So um, I'm, I'm guessing you want to leave discussion on these areas until the end, but I'll just pause here in case. Since this is the one area where there's actually board action, I don't know if you want to discuss it now or wait until we've gone through the full discussion. Does any board member wish to discuss it now? If not, we'll just keep going. Let's just keep going, Marissa. Great. So the next area of review um, is around the uh, fixed perspective payment levels um, uh, and targets reporting. So. Really, um, all that we're doing here is specifying changes that we would like OneCare to make in the way that they report percent of fixed perspective payments. Um, the order requires us to approve or modify and approve the commercial FPP targets, which we've not done um, because we would like OneCare to report it a little bit differently than the way they have. So I put the I put the budget order requirement up here, um, just you know, for reference, but. Um, what we what we need to do is um, make sure that we're kind of on the same page around the reporting. And I thought it was worth sort of presenting what we're looking at today. Um, so I'm going to explain the change and then we will include it in the final reporting manual for FY22. We've already sort of started um, kind of working this out and talking to OneCare about it. Um, and again, this is informational. No board action is, is needed here, um, but discussion is welcome if you have questions or comments. Um, so just a little bit of background, um, there have been different ways of reporting FPP. Um, and through this condition, the staff's working to align the reporting and ensure a shared understanding of what the inputs are. Um, fixed perspective payments also uh, reported through the hospital budget, and we want to make sure that we sort of understand how um, the relationship there is there, because obviously the, um, you know, the dollars are going from the, the payers to one care and to, and to the hospitals. And so we see this in all of the different processes um, and we want to be able to um, align them. So just in the most simplest of terms, um, there's been quite a bit of discussion around whether we are doing the top calculation, which is total fixed perspective payments and comprehensive payment reform payments over total cost of care or only reconciled um, fixed perspective payments and CPR payments over total cost of care. Um, I believe um, or my recommendation is that we want to see both reported. Also, in OneCare's financial sheets, they report total fixed perspective payments as including the Medicare arrangement. Um, but then in the, their, the FPP reporting, they sort of just break out the reconciled. So we just want to make sure that we understand what we are looking at. So um, this slide is the, you know, what OneCare reported. Um, I think back to us it originally back last July around their target for, for fixed perspective payments and then their progress. They presented this last week. Uh, we asked some clarifying questions around what's in or not in there. Obviously, if you look at the Medicare line, they are not including um, the reconciled Medicare AIPVP because it's at zero. Um, you know, however, their financial statements, it, it is in there. Um, and so we want to we want to see both reported. Um, where uh, so this is the slide that we uh, presented in December, um, and I did update it with revised 
with the revised budget numbers just so you can can sort of see. But the difference sort of in the way we're reporting it um, is we pulled the these um, um, inputs, basically the numerators and denominators directly from the one care financial sheets and did the calculations that way. And then we noted, OK, is this reconciled or unreconciled? And then, for example, like in the commercial line, ours comes out a little bit higher, I think. I think because we are including um, maybe the, S the SVMC pilot, I'd have to, to double check. But we want to make sure that we're aligned in the way that um, this is being reported. So essentially, um, where that brings us is that we want the report to have both reconciled and unreconciled FPP. We want to include either the numerator or denominator or make it clearly footnoted to the financial sheets, what is included in those calculations. Um, then I think there's an opportunity to adjust the target slightly if we think we, if, we, if, if that um, is what we want to do or that's what we need to do to approve it. Um, do we want to have a reconciled and an unreconciled target? Um, and um, then, and so in order to get there, the staff's going to issue the reporting manual um, as specified in the budget order, you know, with these changes included and have um, one care sort of report to the new template. Again, no board action is required, um, but we wanted to give you an update on um, what we were doing here, because I think in order to um, really look at those targets and have them be meaningful, we want to make sure that we all are clear about um, how, the, how we're calculating them and, and what we're looking at. So again, it sounds like we can save, save conversation to the end. So I'm going to move on to the next uh, area, which is the ACO budget and financials. So I brought back this slide from our December presentation, um, which is a reminder that the Green Mountain Care Board looks at the ACO's financials um, in two ways. There's the full accountability um, or non-GAAP um, budget look, and this is an all-in financial perspective. It captures expected total cost of care pass-through, contract revenues, organizational, organizational revenues and expenses. This is everything. Um, it's not in line with uh, generally accepted accounting principles um, because uh, much of the revenue is the responsibility of third parties. But it's important for us to see everything that's um, sort of associated with the, with the model. So this is one important look, and that's the big number. Um, we also look at One Care's entity level or GAAP budget, uh, and this captures only the revenues and expenses derived from and incurred by the organization's operating activity in line with uh, accounting principles. This allows us to understand One Care as an operating entity um, and allows us to look at their financials um, uh, in comparison or in line with their audit that they do turn into us. So, um, this is a summary income statement um, so that you can see the change overall with these two looks um, from the original to the revised budget. Many of the line items are rolled up, so I don't, um, I would caution you against reading too much into each individual line. We just wanted to give you a summary look. The full financial sheets are available. Um, we, so we wanted to show both the entity, the gap view, and the full accountability, the non-gap change. So the full accountability change overall is 1%. It's driven mostly by finalized attribution and associated um, cost of care. This is uh, expected, and it's close to the original budget. Um, One Care presented and, and talked about this um, last week. Um, the second major driver of the original to the revised budget um, variance is the change in payer program contract terms which you can see a little bit more easily on the gap side because a lot of that revenue is associated with one care operating activity, which, which is not just an admin, it's admin and programs um, with an overall variance of 9%, um, which is you know, more of a significant change. And the drivers of the change, um, I'm gonna outline more clearly on the next slide. So, <clears throat> um, so on this slide, again, sort of breaking it into the two looks, um, the overall variance on the full accountability is 13.5 million to 1% reduction from the original budget. Again, this is associated with updated attribution and associated total cost of care um, as the greatest variance driver and this type of variance is expected. This is why we do the revised budget um, because those contracts are not finalized at the time of the original budget. 
And so we are not going to be able to see kind of um, what the what the the estimated um, attribution needs to be updated and the numbers need to be rerun. Um, but the the overall variance on the gap side um, is about two point three million dollars or a nine percent reduction. And the final contract terms are the greatest greatest variance driver here. So this um, this has to do with how OneCare made their assumptions. So um, the biggest change is, is was is in the Medicaid contract changes. So the original budget roughly assumed that the 21 terms were going to carry forward to 22, that the 21 Medicaid terms um, would carry through to the 22 contract, and, and that's how the budget, original budget was built. Um, so this means that um, the monthly payment to One Care Vermont um, from, from Medicaid is fixed perspective payment plus the administrative payment, which um, covers the other programs, such as care coordination, um, PHM programs, BBIF, and administrative costs. So previously, um, One Care was allowed to take a portion of the PMPMs and use it to fund their um, infrastructure and administrative costs. Um, and the totals there um, are um, there was about 7.9 million in um, PMPM funding, 3.6 in in care coordination a portion of that could go to administrative costs. I also wanted to note that um, there was the uh, OneCare did not assume um, delivery system reform dollars in 2022. So 2021, they did receive those dollars. That was not built into their 22 assumptions. Um, but the rest of the terms were, were roughly assumed to be the same. Um, the final contract um, or sorry, the revised budget reflects the final contract terms, which looks a little bit different. Um, and now um, the monthly payments that being are being made to One Care represent fixed perspective payments plus what is now called in the contract payment reform support payments, um, and those include care coordination, PHM payments. Um, but the notable change is that those payments can now not be used to fund One Care Vermont operations. Um, they also, they're um, in the final DIVA contract, they negotiated a $2 million DIVA specific value based incentive fund, which um, was discussed last week. Um, and the total in payment reform support payments is reported at $6.5 million. So the takeaway here is that there's less overall in the contract. The PMPMs are less overall, um, but all the money is directed toward providers um, and not um, one care operations. Um, I'll note here that um, uh, Medicaid was the only payer that contributed to operations in previous budget. Um, the commercial payers or Medicare do not um, contribute to operations. So then the difference to fund the operations, um, because the operational budget was kept level, plus the cost of the benchmarking system, is offset by the hospitals. And that shows up in two ways um, in the financial sheets. One is an additional 927,000 in participation fees, um, and basically the the amount um, that 3.6 3.36 million is roughly the care coordination amount, um, which is now um, uh, in uh, offset by by fixed pay, by hospital fixed payments. Um, and again, if you're doing, if you're trying to follow the math here, it's not a one-for-one one difference due to some other adjustments. But I tried to keep the slide as um, clean as possible, even though there's still a lot of information on there. Uh, so I think that gives you a summary of sort of the major contact contract changes from the original budget assumptions to the final. Um, these, what we wanted to show here is just a little bit more detail and some of and quantify some of the amounts that um, One Care presented last week. So, the takeaway on this section is um, you know, Medicaid contract changes are sort of a, a major driver of the difference between the original and the revised budget. Um, the operating budget um, is held level. Um, uh, but it adds the cost of the ACO benchmarking tool, um, which is as the, the board ordered, so that could be implemented. Um, and the um, VBIF was funded as ordered. Um, 
And so the staff recommendation here is to continue to monitor the financial terms of the budget order through quarterly reporting, and uh, there's no board action required. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Sawyer, who's going to walk you through the population health and care model updates uh, from the original budget. Thanks, Marissa. All right, so condition 9D had asked that One Care give us final descriptions of their population health initiatives, uh, including their final care coordination payment model. Um, their initial budget described that the care coordination model would be shifting after receiving some network feedback. Um, so with some stakeholder engagement, they started to revise the model. Um, care coordination payments would be decoupled from the use of Care Navigator, which was their software system, and instead payments would be tied to accountabilities. Um, previously, the care model was one in which providers could earn payments for care managing their patients using Care Navigator. So they're still incentivizing um, that care uh, care coordination for patients, but it no longer do they have to use Care Navigator to receive those payments. Uh, and at the time, the specifics were still being finalized um, and they would communicate it to us in the near future, which is what they have done. And um, the next slide, we will compare the changes that were made to the previous model. So in uh, 2021 and in previous years, this program was uh, available to participants, meaning primary care physicians, uh, preferred providers, which are the specialty non-PCP providers, and collaborators, meaning home health agencies, designated agencies, area agencies on aging, and SASH. So they were all el eligible to earn these care coordination payments. Those payments came through as monthly per member per month um, payments for care coordinated lives. Um, and they could also earn payments for care conferences that were held as, as needed. Um, the, the payments were earned based upon the uh, completion of care coordination tasks that were documented in Care Navigator system. Um, and it was based on the risk stratification of the patient. Um, they were focused primarily on high uh, and very high risk populations. And uh, the amount of the monthly payments were dependent on the care team member position. So lead care coordinators received a higher payment, whereas care team members received a slightly lower amount. So uh, starting in program year 2022, um, the program narrowed its scope slightly to who was eligible to receive these payments. Um, it's now available to primary care physicians, home health agencies, designated agencies, and area agencies on aging. Um, so specialty providers are no longer included, nor is SASH. Um, there are two types of monthly payments now. Um, there is a monthly uh, payment made that is based on the full panel of attributed lives. So they receive, it's a smaller payment, but it's for a much larger population. Um, and that makes up 85% of the pool of funds that are set aside for this program. Uh, and then these organizations, uh, through the attainment of uh, certain quality measures, can earn um, an additional 15% uh, bonus payment that's made on an annual basis. Um, and that 85% that monthly PMPM PM is earned based upon um, completion of care coordination accountabilities. So that looks like um, the submission of triannual reporting to OneCare, um, where they have to show that there is participation in cross-organizational collaboration and shared care planning, um, engagement with OneCare in their process improvements, attendance at education sessions, um, and ongoing subpopulation panel review and outreach. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to dive in just a little bit more deeply because this is a very new model um, on how each one of those um, provider types, how they earn these funds. So for primary care providers, that monthly PMPM, PM, um, they serve as a capacity payment for member months, again, based on their full kind of panel of attributed lives. And then they earn the 15% um, 
uh, annual kind of bonus uh, is available um, and it's tied to the risk adjusted total cost of care of their population. So for home health agencies, um, that monthly PMPM is uh, based on the proportional share of the 2021 care coordination payments that were earned by home health agencies through their use of Care Navigator in the previous year. Um, so they're looking back to 2021 saying what were, you know, what did you earn in um, in that year uh, for care coordination payments and they're kind of basing 2022's payments on that number. And then they can also earn um, an annual bonus um, that is tied to the rate of inpatient admissions for attributed lives uh, after a home health visit. So um, encouraging to keep clients out of the hospital um, and living at home. Next slide, please. Uh, and then designated agencies, their uh, monthly payments, uh, again, uh, th these work a little bit differently. They're based on the proportional share of the total dollar value of claims Care, uh, claims for care provided by designated agencies to attributed lives in the Medicaid program. And then uh, their 15% bonus that's available is tied to primary care physician engagement for their attributed lives that they are actively care managing. Uh, and the Area Agency on Aging, um, their monthly payments are based on the proportional share of the 2021 care coordination payments earned by AAAs through their use of Care Navigator, similar to how it worked for the home health agencies. And then the 15% bonus is available um, tied again to primary care uh, uh, PCP engagement for attributed lives that are being actively care managed, just like it works for the designated agencies. Next slide. Um, so the key takeaways, um, we would love, we we're going to continue to monitor these initiatives and revised care coordination model. Um, there is an evaluation that One Care described to us um, that should be completed in the summer of 2022. So we'll be very interested to hear the results of that evaluation. Um, and at this time, no board action is required. I will hand it back to Marissa. Um, she'll review the budget order conditions. Thank you, Michelle. So we thought this was a good opportunity to just take you through the, the budget order conditions and sort of let you know the status. Again, we monitor uh, the conditions um, and sort of the completion of the conditions throughout the whole year. And this process actually isn't complete until we're into the next year when you get performance results. Um, but I think it's helpful to to periodically um, sort of let the board know where we're at. So um, conditions one and two are around the ACO benchmarking system. I, I, we've talked about this. This is the only area that requires a board action, um, which is to vote on the amendment. Um, the FPP levels and targets um, condition is number three. Um, and this um, is, you know, we're going to we're going to put this um, sort of updated reporting template into the reporting manual and then monitor it. Um, condition four around scale target initiatives and alignment. Um, we received contracts and forms that help us analyze uh, scale target um, and alignment. Um, and this is formally reported um, or GMCB formally reports about scale um, for the, under the all payroll model agreement um, in June. And that will include 2021 final numbers and preliminary 2022 scale results. Uh, the num condition number five is around the benchmark trend rates. Um, we, you know, require the contract to monitor this, um, and so we are, you know, we are reviewing the contracts for that. Um, six was a new condition around working with Medicare Advantage plans in Vermont to develop scale qualifying programs for FY23. So we don't have an update from One Care about that at this time. Just a reminder that it's in there. It's something we'll monitor. I assume ask about in the next budget um, process if we don't know anything before then. Uh, condition seven uh, was around the risk model and seeking approval if there are changes. Uh, we asked them to report this in the revised budget. No changes were ever reported. Again, we monitor it. Um, conditions eight, nine, and 10 are around um, notification of any material changes to the budget the revised budget documentation, the revised budget presentation, these we can actually mark as complete. 
Uh, condition 11 was around the operating expenses not to exceed $15.3 million plus the cost of the benchmarking system. The revised budget is in line with this condition, and we monitor uh, the operating expenses through financial reporting quarterly. Condition 12 uh, was, is to notify the GMCB within 15 days if one care uses reserves, adjust participation fees, or uses line of credit. So this is as needed. Um, we do note um, changes to participation fees and um, hospital fixed payment offsets in this presentation. So we're considering reporting, you know, that that's the reporting. The reporting is done in this process. If there are additional adjustments to participation fees, as there have been in the, the past, um, those would also need to be reported. Um, that's new in this budget order, as well as the other things in here around use of reserves or, or line of credit. So we monitor that throughout the year. Um, one care is to submit their audited financials as soon as they are available. That's anticipated um, in August 22. They also need to submit their most recent IRS Form 990 as soon as it's available. I haven't quite confirmed the date, but I know it'll be sometime in the summer. Um, condition 15 is any revised proposal for population health management programs, if not fully funded. Um, they reported the, the way the contract worked out for the DIVA VBIF. Um, and there are no other PHM changes that were reported in the revised budget um, in terms of, of funding. And then there are some of the programmatic changes that, that they described and, and Michelle described. Um, oops, 16 um, is to fund the VBIF or other pre-funded clinical quality incentive program at a minimum of 2.24 million. That number was chosen because it's level from the prior year. Um, there's actually up to $3 million that's available for the VBIF. This is the uh, $2 million DIVA funded and the $1 million um, One Care funded. Again, we monitor this uh, throughout the year. 17 is the Blueprint and SASH funding, um, which, again, we monitor through financial reporting, um, and it is budgeted as ordered. Um, and finally, condition 18 around administrative expenses being less than the healthcare savings. This condition has been in the order for several years. Um, it's over the duration of the agreement, um, and we do expect to um, have, you know, an assessment from One Care around this um, this condition at the duration of the original agree. I mean, at the completion of the original agreement in 23. So that concludes our remarks. I would turn it back to the chair for board discussion, questions, public comment, a potential vote. And I'll note that we did not receive any written public comment on the revised budget. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I'm going to open it up for uh, board discussion and questions and go in reverse alphabetical order. So starting with board member Walsh, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you, Marissa, for walking us through that. I think um, I just have a quick comment, really. Um, I'm, I'm very in, much interested in uh, the benchmarking project. Um, I'm pleased that uh, they were able to find a Medicare uh, benchmark uh, process or, or a vendor who does that. Um, I'm a little, I'm dis, not discouraged, but I'm looking forward to further work in finding a, a way to benchmark um, commercial and Medicaid. I feel like it's unlikely in searching that they found nothing, All right? And so there's a process for going through an assessment of potential vendors. Um, systems engineers use this process. It's a formal process called an analysis of alternatives. And it recognizes that you're not gonna find a best fit always. And I can, I can send you a link if you're interested, Marissa, th that we can share. Um, so there's a, there's a process for going through this to identify the best available alternative. And I'd suggest that that process be used to identify a way to benchmark with um, One Care's performance with commercial and Medicaid participants. Um, it's important because, you know, in, in the US, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on pet food. We'll pay 
well for things that work well. And the NORC report suggests that one care could be doing some things well. And so paying for it would make sense. But with only financial data like you've presented today, we don't have a sense of how well they're doing. And so the benchmarking piece is fundamental to assessing how well they're doing. And I, I, I just want to say strongly that we really need that, the ability to benchmark. That's it. Okay, Thank you, Chair. next we'll turn to Board Member Pelham, Tom. Well, thank you, Marissa and team, for um, for all this this effort. Uh, there's one or two areas I'd just like to emphasize. If you could go back to slide 12. I realize I forgot to put uh, slide numbers on here. Can you tell me what the header is? Oh, it, it had to do with the FPP uh, targets. It's condition yeah. nine a uh, three a and nine j. There. there you go. <clears throat> so um, I just want to kind of share my observation about this. I uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm very happy. Um, so in one care's presentation, and I'm reading directly from their presentation, they one care said that one care and the commercial partners continue to discuss an unreconciled fixed payment concept for a potential impl implementation in 2023 um, that's pertaining to uh, commercial payers. And uh, <clears throat> then more recently, uh, you know, and this is a good thing, uh, Don George, the head of Blue Cross Blue Shield, has said we must uh, turn determinedly toward value-based payments in global hospital budgets, et cetera. Uh, again, in uh, a, a more recent letter, he said, as we look to the escalating numbers on hospital and drug costs, I am resolved in my conviction that our health care reform efforts are more important than ever to rein in cost increases um, and ensure broad access. So that's a good thing. Um, during our hospital budget review last year, we had Dr. Brumstead uh, relative to commercial <laughs> prospective payments say, and I'll quote, well, I'll just say that we would be first up in any commercial payer wants, if any commercial payer wants to come forward with actuarial derived total cost of care targets and are willing to allow us to have the portion of the premium that would flow through the ACO to support care management. Be first in line, he said. And why I think that's important is that um, obviously the uh, you know the he head of the the largest commercial in insurance entity in Vermont and the head of the largest provider entity in Vermont agree that they want to get um, FPP and it's and we all understand that it's a vital uh, underpinning of healthcare reform. But the problem is um, you know what are the facts on the ground? And the facts on the ground are that as we went through our last hospital budget cycle, there was less than 1% of the payments to hospitals were FPP. And if you flip to the chart here, uh, I think it's like the next slide maybe. Here, you can see um, down there for the insurers, total fixed payments as a percent of expected total cost of care is 1.1%. So the good intentions of Dr. Brumstead and uh, Don George are there, um, but the results aren't there. And um, so as we head into the current rate review season, where Susan said at the beginning of the meeting, we're looking at, you know, um, you know, average increases in the 12 percent, 17 percent range. Um, <clears throat> and then we have a hospital budget process coming up after that. You know, I'm hoping there's opportunity in this tense, uh, you know, tense uh, uh, efforts ahead of us to um, move the ball substantially um, on fixed prospective payments uh, in the name of reform and in the name of cost containment. And so, if you go back to the, the previous slide we were just at, my 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 assumption, my takeaway from this is, if you look at the um, commercial payment expectation for 23, it's at 
and for 24 at 44.9%. I'm going to make the assumption that if that actually occurs, if during the next year or two years, but especially during this coming rate review and hospital budget process, that if we get to that level of commercial FPP, that one care can handle it, that we're not going to be in a situation where one care says, whoa, we, you know, we were hoping we would get there, but um, we really can't handle it. Um, it's not something that we're prepared for. I'm going to make the assumption that they are prepared, prepared for it because it could be a vital part of the, the uh, workout um, of our current um, uh, tensions between uh, the ability of Vermonters to pay um, and the, the demands or hopes of uh, insurers and, and, and hospitals. So um, that, is, that is my comment on uh, observation on this. I just, I just want to you know, put it out there that I, as one board member, I'm going to rely on one care's ability to deliver the goods um, at the projection levels uh, that, that they have in their presentation. Thank you, Tom. Next, we'll turn to board member Lunch, Robin. Robin, uh, I think you're muted. So Robin, um, I'll pass over you and go to Jess and maybe you can sign off and sign back in, Jess. <laughs> yeah, I think she's actually, I'm guessing she's doing that. Uh, unfortunately, I can't kill too much time here because I don't have specific questions or comments other than a thank you to Marissa and team. And um, I, I, I'm like the others, I'm really looking forward to that benchmarking analysis and just, you know, to see that evolve so that we have some capacity to understand how they are doing relative to other ACOs. So I don't have anything more to add here at this time, but okay, thank you. Great. Robin, can you do a sound check? Can you hear me now? We can. Go All ahead. Right. <laughs> I don't know why my team does this so, mo so much. So I have two areas I wanted to just touch on briefly. Uh, one is the care coordination of payment changes. Uh, I really appreciated the clear explanation of the changes in the program from staff. Um, and I'll be very interested to hear uh, more about how the evaluation went and uh, would love to maybe get a bit of a deeper dive during the uh, budget process this fall. Um, I also am interested to see how the benchmarking proposal evolves with commercial and Medicaid and uh, support the staff recommendation um, and the changes there. And that's all I had. Great. Thank you so much, Robin. So next we'll turn it over to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? And I'm going to start with Charles Becker. Hi, um, so my name is Charles Becker. I'm a new staff attorney with the Healthcare Advocate. Can folks hear me? <clears throat> we can. Congratulations on your new position. Great, thank you. Uh, and I understand I you're from Rutland, so you got to be a good guy. I am from Rutland. Uh, well, actually, I live on the other side of the mountain in Stockbridge, but I work out of Rutland. So, yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, I didn't have any questions or comments about the presentation per se. I mean, I, I certainly had plenty of questions, but I'll bring those back to my colleagues. <laughs> um, I just wanted to briefly introduce myself to the board, if that's OK. <clears throat> that's great. OK, hi. So like I said, my name is Charles Becker. Most people call me Charlie. Um, I started with uh, the healthcare advocate in mid-April, um, but I've been uh, with the, uh, the Vermont Legal Aid and the Disability Law Project uh, since 2016, as you said, working out of the Rutland office. So I represented Vermonters in the southern four counties of the state, um, Vermonters with disabilities and seeking access to care and developmental services. Um, certainly uh, enjoyable uh, work, uh, frequently rewarding, challenging work. Um, I really enjoyed getting to know my clients on a personal level. It was, you know, that kind of work is is uh, important to do. Um, but when the HCA position opened up, it seemed to me it was 
too unique of an opportunity to pass up <laughs> um, to uh, be able to engage on a statewide level uh, in policy discussions and helping Vermonters to get access to high quality affordable health care. And so I put my name in for the position and, and here I am now <laughs> uh, looking forward to doing great review with uh, uh, before you all um, and uh, and helping my HCA colleagues to fulfill our other statutory obligations and proceedings before this board. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you and uh, an important question. How often do you get to Tozier's? <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least once a year. They they opened up just recently, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let the crowds cry to, uh, quiet down a bit, and then I'll I'll sneak in. <laughs> I stopped for a maple creamy on my way back from Montpelier last week. It was great. Ah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> With that, um, we'll ask for uh, public comment on the uh, One Care discussion. Does any member of the public wish to offer a public comment at this time? If not, um, does any board member wish to make? Oh, Marissa. Not a, not a public comment, obviously, but I wanted to add um, we did not receive written comment, but we did um, meet with the HCA. Um, I meant to mention that um, and we went over the revised budget and met um, Charles and um, they did give us some questions which helped to inform this review process. So I want to make a note of that. Great. Thank you so much, Marissa. At this time, does any board member have any further comment or does a board member wish to make a motion? I'll move that we uh, amend uh, One Care Vermont's fiscal year 22 budget order by modifying condition one as recommended by the Green Mountain Care Board staff to limit the benchmarking tool to Medicare data for the first year. Uh, and make the other conforming flexible flexible changes as outlined today. Okay, is there a second? A uh, second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record indicate that that motion passed unanimously. Does a board member have another motion? I don't have another motion. Is there any other motion required, Marissa? No, I do not believe so. Okay. So with that, I wish to thank uh, Marissa and Michelle and Russ. And uh, like everyone else, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing the feedback from the uh, benchmarking analysis. And I'm hopeful that the early results come in before July 9th. <laughs> so with that, is there any new old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, it's going to be a rather short and brief meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Enjoy this beautiful Vermont spring day. <laughs>